chat window just to feel your presence. Fine. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to continue my course on quantum transport. Last time we looked at Coulomb blockade and uh, that was uh, a big deviation from scattering theory. We went to strongly interrupting regime. Now we make a step back. We look again at scattering theory, but now in the context of superconductors. So we start with quantum transport in superconducting devices. Well, in order to start, we need to uh, recall basic properties of superconductors. Then we will discover very interesting, very specific uh, type of scattering and wave reflection, which actually mixes up electrons and holes in superconductor. With this, we are able to understand the properties of uh, a contact between normal uh, metal and superconductor very well in terms of scattering matrix. So that uh, illustrates universality of scattering matrix approach, even in this rather unusual situation. Andre F. Conductance. So we get transport formulas e for this situation for a superconducting contact. Right. Then we consider superconductor, superconductor contact, and that will make a link to a very large field, very broad field of Josephson phenomena. We will look what is Josephson effect. We will look at Josephson current and energy. We will understand that Andre Bond states actually cause Josephson effect. And in the end, we will um, consider classical dynamics of Josephson junctions. We will quantize everything in the next lecture when Coulomb blockade and um, uh, scattering and drift scattering is combined. But, well, for the time being, we will uh, look up into classical dynamics of Johnson junctions. Very good. That's the plan for today. Once again, we get back to scattering formalism. But we will uh, later combine strong interaction, Coulomb blockade with superconductivity. Fine. Let us talk about properties of uh, superconductors. Superconductivity has been discovered in Leiden. Uh, those who follow advanced quantum mechanics, uh, yeah, I told you a uh, funny story about the way superconductivity has been discovered by Cameron Ones. That was um, by chance. As all great discoveries, nobody would be able to predict uh, superconductivity in uh, 1911, I guess if it was not discovered by chance, nobody would be able to predict superconductivity in 2011. Uh, it's quite unusual phenomenon. And uh, right, what was the first apparent manifestation of this phenomenon discovered more than 100 years ago? It is zero resistance 
at sufficiently low temperatures, there is a phase transition in many metals at some critical temperature. The resistance of a metal piece just becomes zero, precisely zero, precisely zero. There's no way to measure resistance of a sufficiently big superconductor on the quantum and thermal fluctuations in superconductors could cause some resistance, but it uh, depends to very tiny samples only. Fine. Uh, another manifestation which you might um, remember from um, your school times when we attended open days at our university. Uh, perhaps you have seen levitating superconductor. Uh, that is a manifestation of Meissner effect. So magnetic field is expelled from a bulk superconductor. Um, uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, if you take a piece of superconductor and put it to magnetic field, um, there will be no magnetic field inside. It means that there are currents uh, on the surface, in the surface layer of superconductor. So there are currents running, resistance is zero. So they cause no dissipation. That's why, well, you don't need an energy source to support this situation. That's why they call persistent supercurrents. Sure, in a superconductor, in distinction from all other materials, a supercurrent, electric current, can be property of the ground state of. Uh, the material. It's a more, more um, a strong statement. It's a strong statement than just to say that resistance is zero. Uh, persistent currents are important. Uh, right. I can say a couple of words about mechanism, uh, just uh, on the things which we will need very soon. Um, a cartoon says that superconductivity can be seen as a concentration of Cooper pairs. There is attractive interaction, effective interaction for electrons in superconductor. So they come close to each other, they form Cooper pairs these Cooper pairs are bosons being made of two fermions. And as bosons, they condense, they all go to single quantum state. Right. Sir, so we have an instance of macroscopic quantum state. What are macroscopic manifestations of uh, this um, uh, fact? The superconductivity is characterized by an order parameter which happens to be complex. One could uh, roughly say that it's like a uh, state, and this state has quantum mechanical phase, and this phase is present in a superconductor. Two pieces of uh, two superconductors can have different phases. If you connect them, there will be current going. Uh, that will be Johnson effect to have a bit of preview. In this situation, in the situation of Meissner effect, there are phase gradients along the surface of the sample, which cause this 
superconducting currents. Energy of the superconductor is degenerate with respect to this phase. So it costs very little energy to arrange gradients of the phase. That's why these currents are readily available. Uh, right, one can see this uh, fact, the fact that superconductors have extra parameter phase as a spontaneous breaking of gauge invariance. Right, let me remind you what I usually uh, do to illustrate uh, the concept of spontaneous breaking. Okay, let's have a plane, a floor, and let's uh, put a, a stalk perpendicular to the floor. This is uh, equilibrium state, but this equilibrium state doesn't correspond to energy minimum. It's unstable. That's why the system goes into a stable state. In plant terms, this stock falls. And uh, let us see the angle, the angular position of uh, this um, resulting state. Doesn't depend on the angle at which it falls. Could fall also here or here or here. So there is a degeneracy. Symmetry is broken. The resulting state does have rotational symmetry. Uh, right, so something like that happens in superconductor zone. The point phase is not related to any angle. Phase is just intrinsic property of the superconductor. Very well, it's a bit unusual uh, concept. Well, perhaps you have already learned this, perhaps you have not. So I wonder if there are any questions about this. Does it make sense to you? Does this provoke further questions? It makes sense, yes. Other responses? All right, sure. We will make use of this uh, phase. We will make use of spontaneous breaking happening in superconductors. Uh, let me just uh, look at uh, the spectrum in superconductor to get it more detailed. The message I would like to give that superconductors have a gap for charged excitations. Um, for completeness, I must say that not all superconductors do have a gap. One could have superconductivity face uh, a break in. Uh, spontaneous breaking and phase also for superconductors which do have plenty of charged excitations at low energy but for um, applications like we will consider for quantum applications these um, superconductors are generally useless uh, because well, if you can um, create excitations without paying much energy, 
uh, you just create them you, and you cannot be in a certain quantum state. Uh, the fact that uh, there is a gap eventually uh, uh, enables quantum applications of super. Hi. Hi. Something has happened. I see your presence, so perhaps it was something on my my Side, let us see what I uh, can. I see chat window sound is back again. Hello, and uh, let us see. I need to share my screen. Something has happened, sir. Uh, it was a so far first uh, nuisance of this kind with Zoom. But okay, as any system, it uh, has finite capabilities, and I bet it's now um, at its uh, limits. Many people do communicate online. Very well. I've been talking about spectrum of charge excitations in superconductor, which have a gap. In order to understand this, let us first get to normal matter uh, right what do i have in this plot horizontal line is the energy of an electron counted from femi energy uh, what does it mean zeros here these states are filled these states are empty for electrons so how to arrange a charged excitation in normal metal? One could just place an electron over here. Okay, what would be this energy? This is given by a red line. Uh, one could also extract one electron from field state. And that will result in a hole, which also has positive energy, right? You extract a field electron, so you, you pay energy. This is a whole branch of the spectrum. And uh, what's important that near Fermi energy, the energy required to create such excitations just just drops to zero. That's why uh, normal metals do conduct. It's very easy to create charged excitations in there. Well, how about superconductor? Let me explain, let me give a cartoon what is going on in a superconductor. There is a presence of condensate of Cooper pairs. And it uh, requires no energy to add or extract a Cooper pair from this condensate, right? That's why we can put initially a hole and this hole can um, upload a Cooper pair to condensate and it can become an electron. If it is an electron, it can upload uh, a Cooper pair to condensate and become a hole. So we understand that in superconductors, electrons and holes can not exist separately they interact with condensate 
that's why the resulting charged excitations, quasi particles, or neither electrons nor holes, rather they can be seen as quantum superpositions of electron and hole. I give here an example of equal weight superposition and that correspond to the states precisely at uh, original Fermi energy. If one goes um, away at either lower or higher kinetic energies, then one sees uh, that these quasi-particles become very much like holes, and here they become very much like electrons. So the superpositions are not really equal weight, either electron or whole component dominates. Right? It's important to note that such uh, exchange, such non diagonal matrix element results in a gap. So charge excitations do have a gap in a superconductor. This is uh, how resulting spectrum looks like. It's a hyperbola type, uh, which means there are no excitations at energies smaller than delta. Eventually, as you remember, this is rather a property of a semiconductor, right? We know that semiconductors uh, do have, uh, sorry, I guess I, lost control on the chat window. Let me see. Hmm. Somehow cannot see chart. That's not very pleasant, so how can I? Sir, sure, I guess uh, chat is uh, mal, uh, mal malfunctions. Uh, Sir, sure, I would suggest that you um, speak up then you have question. Uh, somebody uh, put... Work? Yeah, I can hear you just uh, okay. it more distinctly, Jerry. Uh, I was wondering what epsilon was again in this case. Right, uh, sir, epsilon is just energy, actual energy of the, of the excitation. Uh, what stands here is a kinetic energy counted from uh, semi-energy, kinetic energy of an electron. Uh, right, so it is a zero at Fermi surface. Basically, one could say it is uh, K minus K Fermi. So it rather measures uh, momentum of the electron and momentum near Fermi surface is related to energy. So there are also different electron states, a different momentum. And this is actual energy of the states. Does it answer your question, Jerry? Yes, it does. Thank you. Very good. Um, let us see. So we have a gap. And uh, as I promise, it will be useful. <laughs> now let me uh, 
go to Andreev's get, uh, get time, Andreev reflection. For this, let us consider charge transport between normal material and superconductor. And we don't want to write any formulas at the moment. We just apply healthy reasoning, which appears to lead to rather healthy, strange results. Uh, good, so we take normal metal, we know how the spectrum looks like. Uh, we take superconductor, and just for fun, um, to make our life simpler, we connect these two with an ideal nanostructure, no reflection. It can be quantum point contact, or it can be just a very good interface between these two materials which has no reflection so if there's no superconductivity on the right side electrons would just go through this interface without any scattering okay let's imagine this then let us uh, uh, try to comprehend it uh, uh, with um, with uh, energy consideration. So let me uh, have an electron which uh, flies uh, in normal metal towards superconductor at a certain energy. If this energy bigger than a gap energy, well, it has two places to land here and here. So it has a chance to be transmitted but if its energy is in this window, no way, it just cannot go. And it cannot disappear at the interface. Then what? what the health reason would tell us, it would have to turn back. But it cannot turn back because there's nothing at the interface which would provide adequate change of momentum. It has to flip its velocity, it has to flip its momentum. That's why of all possibilities, it is reflected as a whole, and this is the process. This is the process which is called Andreev reflection. Right, the Andreev reflection is complete for these energies in this window. If there's a possibility, to enter superconductor at high energy, uh, Andreev reflection is partial. So part of the electron indeed propagates in superconductor, while part of it is reflected as a whole. Good. That's a bit paradoxical conclusion. And yeah, we came to this conclusion without any formulas, just uh, with health series and in. Uh, just listing all possibilities of what can happen. Let's look at it in more detail. Andreev reflection for ideal non structure, so no scattering. The only possibility is that a, a, an electron is reflected as a whole. In the same way, we can argue about a whole and a hole which goes from uh, normal metal to superconductor should have similar stories on the point, it will be reflected as an electron. Good, let us uh, run a full proof check of this process we just discovered. Let us check uh, conservation laws. Right, energy before and after. Uh, the process is the same uh, hole, which is reflected, has precisely the same energy as an electron, which goes a uh, torch. 
apparently it does not conserve charge. Uh, instead of electron with negative charge, we have a hole with positive charge. But if we look at attentively what is uh, going on, it is uh, charged to E, which goes into superconductor. So a process of uh, Cooper pair uh, creation, uh, each process of Andreev reflection is accompanied with a creation of a single Cooper pair in superconductor. That conserves charge. It gives a kind of um, a physical realization of a very unusual uh, concept, right? So sometimes uh, still in supermarkets, you can see announcements. You can have two things for the price, uh, for the price of one, that's what we get. We just uh, uh, push one electron into superconductor, so we expect the charge transfer of E. We got charge transfer of two E. Right, momentum. Momentum is uh, almost conserved because uh, there's a relation between uh, momentum and velocity is opposite for electrons and holes. All has opposite velocity, so same momentum. There's also spin conservation uh, enabled. That comes from uh, the fact that Cooper pairs, uh, I didn't say it, they are made of electrons with opposite spins. So total spin of a Cooper pair is zero, so spin is conserved. During the scattering, this electron spin is the same as a whole spin. Fine, um, that was Andrei's reflection. Uh, let's see if I can invoke chart once again. No, that doesn't work, moreover. Uh, good, so please don't, uh, uh, since chart is not working, please don't hesitate to speak up, to unmute yourself and uh, ask me something. Otherwise I will uh, lose the feeling of your presence and uh, focus on the presentation. So please be assertive and I will go. Uh, right, let me say that Andre reflection eventually realizes the magic mirror will um, talk about this magic mirror at lecture number uh, three, I believe, right? This magic mirror uh, provided a reflection when a reflected particle uh, goes with the same uh, uh, in the same in opposite direction as the incident particle and besides it perfectly keeps face of this particle right we have uh, uh, already realized but this time that it cannot may uh, be made with a single component wave function. One needs two component wave functions to provide magic mirrors. And uh, here we have a realization. So instead of talking about particles, let's talk about waves. And uh, what we have here are electron waves and whole waves, which are mixed, which are coherent. Uh, the structure which uh, replaces uh, wave equation for electrons, Schrodinger equation, 
is called Bogolubov Dijen equations. Let me quickly outline the structure. How does it look like? Uh, it uh, wave functions are two components, and we have uh, blocks corresponding to this structure. It's a usual Hamiltonian Schrodinger equation. Here and here. So if there is no delta, if there is no superconductivity, non-diagonal blocks are zero. And we just have two separate equations for electrons and holes. Let me sketch uh, one for electrons. from this block. But if there is a superconductivity, uh, there, are, uh, there is a mixture of electrons and holes, you really don't have um, uh, independent wave functions. So if I bring this block, I would have delta hole wave function. And similar equation I would have for um, the whole part. So, if uh, an electron from uh, normal metal comes to a superconductor and gets reflected as a whole, this realizes a magic mirror two component wave function and they're on a particle language on, uh, on the language of uh, geometric optics when we can uh, talk about waves and rays. Uh, an electron ray is reflected as a whole ray and the face of these rays uh, is precisely the same. So the magic mirror preserves phase coherence between electrons and holes. Fine. Again, uh, let me see. Perhaps chat started working or no, doesn't. Strange. It's the first time I've been using Zoom like for a dozen times, and uh, now we. It's rather unpleasant. Anyway, uh, let's go on the smart software running on my computer and possibly there was some interference. So don't um, forget to speak up if you have a question. Right. Uh, since uh, we have lives, uh, it makes sense to talk about Andreev reflection amplitude. A phase vector which is acquired when an electron is converted uh, to whole. If you talk about particles, we are only interested in probabilities. Probability of conversion is one. Nothing to talk about. If we talk about waves, we care about Andreev reflection amplitude. Uh, good. I would not write the question how to derive it. I would just sketch how does it go. Uh, in order to uh, find this amplitude, one needs to solve uh, this Bogolubov Dijon equation. Uh, right. What we will have on the normal side. We will have uh, waves, electron wave and whole wave. And uh, they would go to superconductor. It's important to understand that Andreev uh, reflection uh, doesn't happen instant, uh, doesn't happen in a point of the interface. It requires some lens for electron and whole waves to get into superconductor. 
to get correlated by means of uh, Cooper condensate. And finally, they figure out that they don't belong to here. Superconducting condensate causes gap and eventually repels these wave functions. In mathematical terms, it means that they decay exponentially uh, with some typical lens, correlation lens in superconductors that can be long, that can be 100 nanometers. In any case, it's much, much bigger than atomic scale. But for the phase, it doesn't matter. You can solve this problem and figure out there is a phase change between electron which enters an hole which is reflected. This phase change picks up superconducting phase of this particular superconductor. That's nature. It has also energy dependent contribution which will become uh, important a little bit later when we talk about Andreev bound states. At the moment, let's just uh, keep in mind that there is an energy dependent phase in Andreev reflection amplitude. Very good. So we kind of sophisticated the picture of Andreev reflection we have. It's not just a reflection on the uh, language of particles. It also involves wave properties of the phenomenon. Uh, it involves a phase difference between incident electron and reflected hole. Let's see. Yep. We still have some time for the break. Andreev and normal reflection. Okay. Again, with a simple reasoning, we can combine these two. Um, let us consider non-ideal nanostructure. And uh, what does it mean? It can reflect incoming electrons. So we have uh, two possible processes. There is some ref reflection, incident electron is reflected as a whole, and normal reflection, electron is reflect, uh, reflected as an electron. Let us see what is in the figure. Uh, we have incoming electron. And there is an amplitude for it to be reflected as whole, and there is an amplitude to be reflected as an electron. Good, that's all clear. That's why I have control questions. I don't know how would you, I can uh, pose a question rather easily, but I wonder how would you answer given circumstances. Um, so let me um, give uh, um, answer as a series of hints and see how would you react. Um, first of all, uh, current. How we would compute the current in this situation. Let me first talk about uh, purely normal reflection. Let us assume that I don't have any superconductor. The current would be, let me count current in this direction, and contribution to the current in this channel would be one from incoming electron, and there will be a wave uh, in with opposite velocity. Amplitude of this wave is Rn. So what I will Draw now spread of normal reflection amplitude with minus sign. 
Good. It's for normal reflection. I don't have. Uh, I don't have Andreev reflection. And uh, okay, perhaps uh, um, we can figure out how to add Andreev reflection amplitude now. Who dares to put? forward a hypothesis. Hello. Again, chat still doesn't work. I will, uh, I guess I will uh, restart this meeting. We will restart Zoom. Uh, there will be a break shortly. Uh, right. So it is, um, I see no suggestion coming. So let me give the answer. Uh, the answer should also contain squared of Andreev amplitude, probability of Andreev reflection. So this is current, which is proportional to. Um, let me remove this confusion sign. Sure, I have very plain direct question. What is here? Plus or minus? Please somebody give an answer. It's a... Should be a plus sign, right? Yes, it has to be a plus sign. Uh, can you reason this? Uh, because it's a different charge, so uh, the current goes the other way? Yes, precisely. That's a hole. It goes an opposite way, but it's whole. It gives opposite contribution to the current. Very good. We have formula for the current. Another part of the question, what is the current at low energy? Hint is to use probability, a conservation of probability. So in this case, the chance to transmit to a superconductor is zero, which means that probability of Andreev reflection plus probability of normal reflection equals two. Who can give the answer? Once again, these are only outcomes in at sufficiently low energies. At high energies, electron also could transmit but now it can also only reflect it as a as an electron. Very good. So I'm back. Please uh, type OK in the chat if you're ready for me to start. Fine. So we will combine Andreev reflection. Uh, uh, we have combined Andreev reflection and um, uh, normal reflection. We understand what the current is. We understand what the current at low energy. We can kind of uh, make use of this relation. Uh, let me get this. Let me get the amplitudes of uh, Andreev and normal reflection for this particular case. Let me go to the next slide. So let me take a nanostructure, which is between normal metal and superconductor. Um, to keep it simple, let me take only one conducting channel. And if you have more, we could just sum up over these channels. Uh, let me uh, set a problem. The nanostructure 
is uh, characterized by a scattering matrix. Like everything we look, which you look at, uh, four electrons, what is this? It just has some reflection coefficient from the left to the right, from the uh, right to the left, and some transmission coefficient. I assume time reversibility to these transmission coefficients here and there are the same. Sorry, I should not say coefficient, I should have said amplitude. Transmission amplitudes are the same. Um, for holes, if I consider scattering for holes, I have to take into account that the uh, hole is inverted electron and the quantum mechanics inversion means um, uh, complex conjugation. So in simple terms, um, the matrix, uh, scattering matrix for holes, it just inverted. So holes are very similar to electrons. The chance uh, to be reflected is the same, but the phase is uh, opposite. If we just uh, consider, let me start with this. If we just consider this process, simplest one, uh, whereby um, a normal electron goes through the structure. And we know from our scattering considerations, that means that it, uh, its uh, amplitude of this process acquires a factor t. Now it gets to superconductor, it is reflected, well, it acquires some Andre phase. In this case, I convert from electron to hole uh, uh, EH. And then it has to be transmitted through the structure, again, now as a whole. Right, so I put a factor T conjugated. And now I observe that the phase of transmission, it could be reflection, it cancels here. I have T and T conjugated. Could write it as a, a same factor. I could write it as a modulus T squared transmission coefficient times and wave phase. Right, and this is an effect of uh, magic mirror of into transmission. Um, electron does acquire as a phase, but this phase is canceled if, the, if it goes back as a whole. So it works as magic mirror. Fine, uh, now what we are going to do, it's a simplest process which we have considered so far. There, one can easily imagine more complex processes, right? So that's the next in complexity. An electron is and they have scattered from the structure. A hole goes to the left, it is reflected from the structure. Then it has another chance to be Andreev transmitted, uh, or to be Andreev reflected. So it appears to be an electron. And uh, this electron can be reflected again. And finally, it is reflected as a whole. So in this case, uh, a particle bounces between nanostructure and um, superconductor twice uh, one time as an electron and uh, another time as a whole.
Good. Or perhaps control uh, question. What is the charge transferred to superconductor in the course of this process? Please type your answer in the chat window. Yeah. Yes. So what matters is the difference of charge between initial and uh, final state. And this difference of charge is uh, two E. So after all, the full charge transfer is two E. Fine. Uh, let me go on. Uh, let me sum up all these processes. Right. Uh, it is a problem which is very similar to the problem we have considered already when we consider, um, you remember what, the scattering through double barrier structure, transmission through double barrier structure. In fact, it's very similar calculation. So first process available. This is a uh, amplitude which we acquire. The amplitude has infinitely many terms coming from the processes uh, which have uh, which are more complex. Uh, each process is process of the kind brings uh, an extra factor. Let me outline this factor. Here it is. So for a uh, next process uh, with four bounces, we would have a square root of this factor. Then we will have a uh, third power of the spectre, and we sum all them up, and it's again geometric series summation. Uh, here I put the result. I couldn't see it myself, that's why I'm moving window a bit. Right. Here I put transmission coefficients and reflection coefficients of the structure because at any rate I will have t, t conjugated, which is uh, transmission coefficient, transmission probability, the same with reflection amplitude. Right, so this is the result of the summation. Uh, right. This phase, as I mentioned, does depend on energy. Let me concentrate on uh, small energies. Closer to Fermi surface, just to have a simple answer. And that happens to be uh, minus pi over two, this phase, so I put it here. That will give me uh, minus for this factor. Uh, very well, now I have to square it. I have to square amplitude to have uh, the chance of engraved reflection. I square it, here it is. And we see that we can, with very simple means, uh, solve for us a complex problem of a scattering between the normal material and superconductor, expressing them in terms of transmission coefficient of the nanostructure. So superconductivity enters into the problem as a property of a lead and not the property of nanostructure itself. All right, this is valid for sufficiently short nanostructures. Shorter than uh, the coherence lens I mentioned. Correlation lens and superconductor. You remember, Andreev reflection happens at a certain lens scale. 
uh, which brings us uh, to nanostructures which are like uh, 100 nanometers long. Right, so there is a strange uh, relation between uh, transmission coefficient in normal case, T, and coefficient of Andreev reflection. I don't remember whether I have the reason in the next page. Let me quickly. Uh, yes, I do. So let me just uh, flip at this page. So let me talk about Andreev conductance. So I have a nanostructure. Doesn't matter how many channels is this. I can sum up our channels. And what I get is an analog of uh, Landauer formula. Good, conductance is related to Andreev reflections. There is a factor of two because the charge which is uh, transferred in the course of single reflection is 2 E. Uh, right, and well, it depends on transmission coefficients in normal state. Uh, let me take some uh, limits of this expression. And uh, first, I would look at tunnel junctions. And for tunnel junctions, all T's are much smaller than one. Uh, right, so one can neglect it here in the denominator. And I've got actually square, sum of squares of transmission coefficients, but each TP is smaller than one, so it must be much, much, much smaller than one. And uh, I understand that Andreev reflection from tunnel junction is much smaller than, than tunneling conductance in normal state. So for tunneling, Andreev, uh, conductance into superconductor is very much suppressed. But in opposite case, QPC, if one sets it to one here and here, the conductance, uh, oh, well, I have to put one here, otherwise it's not good. The conductance is doubled. The conductance is doubled, so conductance to superconductor is more efficient than conductance to normal metal. Right, so for big transmissions, it's, uh, it's bigger, up to a factor of two. It appears to be, uh, well, and if we have a, a connector of arbitrary type, one would have to use transmission distribution to figure out what is this, what is the uh, suppression or perhaps enhancement of Andreev conductance with respect to normal conductance. It happens to be, sir, for diffusive conductor, we, Recall that its transmission distribution is something special. Well, eventually there's no difference between Andreev conductance and normal conductance. For a diffusive conductor, it, the presence of superconductivity kind of uh, is not felt. Fine. It was about Andreev conductance uh, properties of a contact between normal metal and superconductor. Uh, why the two disappears between uh, at the tunnel junction? Well, it's because of this uh, denominator. TP is small, so we have four in the denominator. Right, can you follow? So we have one half here. Anyway, it's just a proportionality coefficient in front of uh, square root of the transmission. Good. I'm happy you can follow to to, to such uh, such details. 
Fine, that was on grave conductance. Let me just uh, show all these formulas, uh, flash these formulas into glory. Let me go uh, farther. Let me come to Josephson effect. Josephson is a person, and when he discovered Josephson effect, uh, he was a very young student, um, perhaps of your age, and uh, in his PhD work, he just made all possible uh, discoveries of the Josephson effect, which we still use for more than 40 years. Um, after that, he kind of uh, changed the focus of uh, his scientific interests. Um, he became interested in uh, telekinesis, things like that. And it appears to be much more difficult problems that uh, Joseph, uh, Josephson effect superconductor. So uh, there was no much progress so far. But well, he is still active, so perhaps we can have some more discoveries. Josephson effect. What was there? traditionally people talk about uh, DC Josephson effect and AC Josephson effect. They're related. And uh, let me talk first about um, uh, DC effect. So again, let me take two superconductors. Instead of normal metal superconductor, we will take superconductors. And let me have phase difference between superconductors. So we know that superconductor is characterized by a phase. If you connect to the phases can be different. And somewhere here, the constriction we place a nanostructure. In this case, we make sure that if uh, uh, that any current, if, if there is a current, would go through this constriction, would go through our nanostructure. And the message is there is a current. So in a contact bias at the phase difference phi, there is a super current. It is periodic in uh, phi, and this phi is a phase difference between the superconductors. Uh, why it's uh, periodic in phi? Uh, it's perhaps uh, you have forgotten already. Uh, this is uh, definition of uh, or the parameter of superconductor. It has phi. So if we change phi by two pi, we got precisely the same state, precisely the same superconducting state. It's precisely the same physical properties. So that sets the fact that this uh, supercurrent is periodic in phi. We can give two pi shift to any of this uh, of these uh, phi's. We shift uh, resulting uh, phase either by plus or minus two pi. And we got precise to precisely the same physical state. So this explains why it is periodic. This periodicity becomes important for the next step for AC Johnson effect. So in this case, we bias this contour, uh, this contact by voltage V. And there is important universal relation uh, which comes from gauge invariance. Superconductors break uh, gauge invariance, and uh, right, uh, if um, that's why there is a relation between superconducting phase and voltage, which does not depend on anything. The relation is as follows voltage applied 
gives a constant velocity to this phase. So it results in a phase sweep, linear phase slip. Phase becomes linear function of time if constant voltage is applied here. This is called, not to be surprised, Josephson relation. Okay, let me uh, substitute this phase into the current. We have linear time dependence would go to the current, but the current is periodic function of the phase. For instance, uh, it could be sine by substituting linear equation for phase, we got harmonic signal at the corresponding frequency. Frequency called Joseph frequency to EV divided by H bar. That's uh, I'm using was quite uh, surprising at this time. Uh, usually, if you apply uh, constant voltage, you expect uh, constant current, DC current. In uh, Johnson contact, that doesn't work. Instead of this, you have uh, an AC current of a certain amplitude and if the voltage is uh, constant also of a certain frequency josephson effect has been discovered by uh, a student theoretically eventually and uh, that was a uh, very hot topic and still remains a hot topic any point that we go now from um, simple plain Johnson junctions to qubits combining uh, thousands of such Johnson junctions into quantum computation circuits. Uh, good, sir. That was a phenomenological description of Johnson effect. I didn't say anything about nanostructure, which uh, which connect these two leads. Uh, let me try to uh, get into the details. Let me try try to uh, consider such a nanostructure. Or I forgotten to explain one thing. I forgotten to explain the thing which we will use soon i've forgotten to explain the relation between josephson current and energy of this contact which is josephson energy uh, right so the energy of the whole system each and includes the energy of the leads but most places are distinct uh, are distant from the junction and thereby they don't depend on the phase difference between the con uh, the junction there is a, uh, only a small piece of superconductor um, which uh, is around the junction around the nanostructure which is sensitive to the phase difference it can feel both superconductors and there's uh, energy, a part of the energy which does depend on phase. Which this is called Josephson energy. Uh, let me consider the relation between Josephson energy and the current. I will need two elements. I will need uh, an equation from dissipation, which I believe you know from your school days. And I will need 
Josephson relation. The relation between um, between uh, voltage and um, time derivative of phase. Good. Uh, then uh, let me um, take uh, this superconducting contact and let me vary the phase slowly in time and let me figure out the change of uh, energy uh, per unit time. Good. As we know from school days, this is dissipation in this electric circuit and this is current times voltage. Let me put um, expression for voltage in terms of uh, phase change. Here it is. So this is proportional to uh, derivative of the phase. There is a proportionality coefficient. All right. Let me treat this formula differently. Let me just uh, understand that variation of this energy, which depends on phase, is a time variation of phase times derivative of the energy with respect to phase. Right. That all this works. Eh? If I have any energy as a function of any parameter, I change this parameter, I got a uh, uh, change of phase proportional to the derivative with respect to this parameter, which means that we can associate the current and this derivative. Here we have it. Here we have it. Um, I'll lose your presence again. Would you mind to type uh, what, whatever you please into chat? Fine. Very good. Hi. Good. Sir, so we find uh, the relation between Josephson current and Josephson energy, which means that if you compute energy, we can compute. Uh, just as some current, we will use that. Um, that sets go. We will approach this in two steps. First, we will consider the scattering in Josephson contact. What is this other model? We have two superconductors biased at the phase difference. And uh, I put a nanostructure in the middle. Let me understand what are possible incoming and outgoing waves. Uh, right. Uh, I can have incoming electrons from the left or from the right. I can have incoming holes again coming from the left to the right. Now, structure reflects it back. So we have outgoing electrons to the left to the right, outgoing holes to the left to the right. That's what nanostructure does. And okay, it's reasonable to assume that incoming electrons are converted to uh, outgoing electrons, uh, holes to holes, uh, because uh, nanostructure doesn't have enough superconductivity to provide and wave reflection. Again, provided it is short. Um, sure. We can characterize it with a scattering matrix for electrons and for those, as we remember, just conjugated uh, matrix, complex conjugated matrix. That's what's all right. 
uh, incoming waves are trans uh, transformed with a scattering matrix into outgoing waves. This matrix has block structure, separate blocks for electrons and holes. Good, we have considered nanostructure. We are not done yet. We need to consider superconductors. Right. So let us understand what's going on in superconductor and uh, uh, electron which comes to superconductor on the left. Guess what? It is reflected as a whole. It goes here. It also acquires a phase factor. Uh, a hole is reflected as an electron. So that we can write down as a matrix which relates uh, the waves which in come into superconductors either on the left or on the right to the waves which go out of superconductors. They are related by this matrix. And the matrix has non diagonal terms converting electrons into holes with corresponding phases either from left superconductor or from right superconductor. So there is a bit of a structure in this expression. One can uh, follow the structure, paying attention to the indices from the left, from the right. So uh, it's, um, in short, you need to look at this picture to understand the structure. Does it work for you? Look again at the structure of scattering matrix. Look again at this picture. Does it help? Hmm? Shall I explain this once again? Uh, do I have to explain this again? Relation between picture and uh, structure of this matrix elements. Fine. Um, let us see. There is a hole which is reflected from nanostructure at some time. It goes to superconductor, which is on the left, and uh, it is converted into electron, which is on the left, it stays on the left, which goes out of superconductor. Right? The phase change, which is acquired in this case, uh, yeah, let me write it here. We convert hole into electron on the left side. Right, let's look here. We have incoming wave, let me find it. Here it is. And it is connected to this outgoing wave here. So corresponding uh, matrix element has to be in the first row and third column. Okay, here it is. All right. In the same way, we can find correspondence between all other 
elements, for instance, from here to here. It is uh, here. It goes uh, here. So here it is. So that's how it works. Now we have the scattering from superconductors, from nanostructure. It's time to combine them together. I just um, understand simple thing. Ways which are incident to nanostructure, they outgoing ways for superconductor and vice versa. Right, so what does it mean? If one considers waves uh, incoming to the structure, they are related to outgoing waves, but they originate from outgoing waves. By means of wave scattering. What does it mean? We have a closed equation for outgoing waves. Right. And it doesn't have always a solution. It has solution only if this matrix has eigenvalue one. Otherwise, the determinators not, don't match. So we don't, don't have always a solution, not at each energy these waves can persist. It can, they can persist only at a given energy. And energy comes here as a energy dependence of Andreev phase. Good. This is a bit different from scattering problems we have considered so far. In those scattering problems, you always have some initial incoming wave. Here we don't have any. We cannot, because at these energies there are no waves in superconducting leads. So we need to concentrate on the waves which are inside which are between two superconductors. That's why we have solutions for these waves only at given energies. And if you look at it from quantum mechanical point of view, these solutions correspond to bound states. Bound states, which are states, quantum states, localized at the nanostructure. Fine. So putting everything into this matrices, energy dependence, uh, transmission coefficients, all that, uh, brings us to that celebrated uh, formula, which I guess was derived by Carla ben Professor Benaker in uh, Leiden. Again, superconductivity was discovered in Leiden. This formula has been discovered in Leiden. Everything is consistent. Uh, right, which gives uh, the following. This gives the energy of Andreev bound state inner contact is a given transmission in normal state as a function of superconducting phase difference. So let me plot it. Here's a plot 
Uh, I would uh, rather zoom on this plot. Energies against the phase. Uh, right, these are curves at different transmission. Here, I have very low transmission. So the curve is very, very close to the gap edge. So uh, above this one, above this delta, there is a continuum of uh, quasi-particle states and superconductor. And bound state is very close to this edge. Uh, small transmissions, this is a typical uh, configuration for a tunnel junction. For large transmissions, it can go quite deep. Let me get intermediate transmission. What has happened to my pen here? It should work this way. Intermediate transmission. So it goes deeper. The deepest point it achieves at the phase pi, when uh, uh, kind of signs of superconducting other parameters are opposite for two junctions. Okay, and this is periodic and phase difference as I promised. Uh, finally, at ideal transmission, ideal transmission, it dives uh, uh, at uh, just, just to zero, this curve, it reaches zero. Um, Andre uh, stayed just at uh, Fermi energy. So here I basically plotted this formula. Good. We know that there are excitation energies for each state. And these excitation energies have certain dependence on the phase. Well, who cares? It draws about ground states and this excitation and this. Nevertheless, there is a point that ground state energy in a superconductor is eventually expressed in terms of uh, excitation energies. If you're on quantum mechanics, I explained it, uh, what was that time goes that fast these days. I believe it was on Monday this week. Good, so if you know excitation energies, we also know ground state energy. And uh, what is uh, uh, important is that we can evaluate its phase-dependent part. But we remember the phase-dependent part is related to current through the structure. So from that we can evaluate Josephson current superconducting current. Okay, there is a simple analytical formula for that. There is a sum of overall transmission coefficients in the structure. Was it a small or not? Here the plot is for um, a different transmission coefficients. Uh, let me look at this branch on this. This is a very small one. And you see, well, it is basically proportional to transmission coefficient. And uh, here, the result for ideal transmission. So it goes like this. Oh, 
uh, what does it mean that if transmission is slightly non-ideal, let me put 99% aspect of this, it just dives very quickly to zero. Make something like this, which you can see for other transmissions. All right, that's how, how current uh, depends on the phase. Let me look at the limits. These are important. Uh, in fact, Josephson uh, junction is used to be channel junction. For many, many years, like for almost 30 years, the Josephson effect could have been observed only in uh, tunnel junctions. Tunnel junctions still remain an uh, important uh, technological element for even modern technology, uh, but now we can get it better. We can have Josephson current at uh, high transmissions as well. Uh, but usual implementation uh, was and remains tunnel junction. So all transmission coefficients are smaller, smaller than um, one. In this case, we could neglect the denominator in previous formula. Here we are. And we can sum up neatly overall transmission coefficients. This boils down to Josephson conductance. So there is a direct relation between superconducting current and the conductance of the tunnel junction. It involves energy gap in the superconductor. So this gives us formula for Josephson energy, which is used, yeah, there are also names associated with this used to be called a big old formula. Fine. Uh, that sounded uh, very strange. By the time of the discovery, why is it so there are superconductivity, there's something new phenomenon. Nevertheless, the properties related to superconductivity, we can um, relate to the properties of normal structure. For us, it should be no surprise because we understand that transport in any case is a case of scattering and both quantities are related to the same scattering matrix. That solves the surprise they had uh, many years ago. Fine, that was tunnel junction. And let me assume this form of Johnson energy. We will also utilize it in the next lecture. Let's see how I'm doing with respect to time. Oh, I'm doing pretty bad. Uh, anyway, I guess I will go on for uh, about 10 minutes. If you cannot follow, you just drop. Uh, and I will tell you about uh, classical dynamics of Johnson Junction, very interesting subject. Uh, it's interesting because it's one of the subjects when one can see analogies between very different fields of physics and uh, um, apply it for your reasoning. Good. So we consider a Josephson junction. And here in the scheme, I denote it with this element, just the cross. Cross reminds that there are two superconductors coming in a point like this. Fine. Next to this, in series with this, I will have some resistance that brings uh, a dissipation, which I would need to stabilize the system at finite voltage because Josephson junction by itself would not do this. It does have any 
any uh, resources to store energy. It is too small, there are only bound states, there's nothing to store energy into. And I will also add a capacitance also in series. We will figure out the functions of these elements just in a second. Um, let me write an equation, a dynamical equation for this circuit. This is uh, pretty simple. If I remember circuit theory, the total current which I apply, let me put it as a current source, is a sum of three currents. Current from Josephson junction one. Here it is, here I put it as a function of the phase. Current through the resistor. This is voltage divided by resistor. And that was two. Current number three. This is current through capacitor. There will be no current at constant voltage. If voltage is changing in time, we remember what is the current through capacitor. It's time derivative of the voltage. Now I need to recall Josephson relation. I should replace uh, voltage with a time derivative of the phase. Uh, no, single derivative, sorry. Because I, I was just looking into this. Good, so this term will become second derivative. I get it here. I will uh, rescale time to get dimension with coefficients. Uh, and uh, that would come from resistor and that come from Josephson. Fine. It's kind of not very easy to remember and even uh, more difficult to imagine. Just uh, keep with me. And the current coming at this. Uh, let us see. This is what comes from the resistor. I can regard as a quality factor. So it depends on the resistor. It can be very bad quality factor, very good quality factor, depending on the on the relation between um, resistor and uh, capacitor and the typical frequency in this just some junction. Fine. This looks complex not really it's not complex at all if you just use your imagination proper model and uh, if you recall a little bit of uh, classical mechanics good this is a uh, famous uh, title, Weisbert Potential. Uh, Weisbert, it uh, kind of shows that it's uh, quite an old model. I believe yet that you don't know what uh, Weisbert is. Uh, let's see how many of you are left. So, uh, who knows who, what is this uh, Weisbert? Okay, you know, you, you really kind of, uh, you, you, you should know everything. So, Weisbert is a device made of uh, steel. 
it had a profile like this. In order to wash something, your grandma put it into the wash bird, applied kind of well, it's supposed to be her hand. So it just uh, push uh, things um, um, along the profile, and that uh, that gave uh, that gave quite some effect on wash things, wash birds. And uh, what we have here is a case of this washboard potential. Right. So the good analogy is to regard this face as a coordinate of a particle, which, so I replace x, uh, I replace phi by x, we have a notion of, of a coordinate which moves in a potential of this kind. It is tilted because of the current. And it has uh, this profile, oscillating profile, because of Josephson and energy. So this is a potential. And there's a particle moving in this potential. Capacitance eventually gives a mass term inertia of this particle. And resistance provides dissipation for this particle. Sure, we can uh, uh, understand everything about classical dynamics of Johnson junction. If you just think about motion of particle in such a potential, we, and it can have inertia, it can have also a friction. Let's do this for the remaining minutes. Let is important for us that um, uh, there are two different regimes in the system. And this is characterized by critical current. So suppose this slope, which is set by current, is smaller than uh, some critical value. Then the resulting wedgeboard potential has a set of minima. Good, the resulting particle coordinate, the resulting phase difference can be in one of these two of these minima. We remember so all minima are equivalent because if you change phase difference by two pi, you don't really change uh, your system. Fine, so what we have, so if the current is smaller than the critical one, Josephson junction gets to one of this minima. And uh, in this case, there is no voltage. Why? Because voltage means the motion of the face with respect to uh, motion of the face in time. Good, let us increase the current. So at some stage, minima would disappear at critical current. And the washboard potential would be just like this without minima. What will happen with a particle with a Johnson jun junction? Put particle here, it will go downhill, downhill, downhill. If there's inertia, it will accelerate. At some stage, the friction would um, come in equilibrium with um, acceleration, and the particle would move with constant velocity. Constant velocity means constant voltage. So at uh, currents exceeding critical one, we expect expect uh, just some junction to behave like uh, normal contacts we know um, when there is a constant voltage and constant current. All right, that was a story about classical dynamics of uh, Josephson junction. Um, good, so um, 
observed by thank you for attending this lecture we'll see you next time online in a week so i will post uh, the recording it takes kind of uh, several hours eventually to convert this recording that's why uh, i cannot post it immediately for your enjoyment uh, it will appear close to the afternoon so thank you very much i stop sharing i end the meeting